webinar of the year. Uh, today we're going to be covering uh, some stuff uh, related to color settings in ES. And I'll remind everybody that if you uh, can't see anything, uh, everything correctly on screen, at the top left of your uh, go to webinar client, there should be a little zoom button that allows you to zoom in or out as you need to to make sure you see everything. Uh, for questions and answers, uh, please go ahead and type any questions you have into the little questions uh, part of the client uh, for GoToWebinar. Uh, we'll field all those after the webinar, or if I see something that's relative and uh, interesting, I'll go ahead and interrupt Mike and, and bring it up as he's covering it. So please put those in there so we can make sure we get, answer all your questions. Um, I'm hoping to, I would think there will be a lot of different questions. Uh, on this uh, related to this, Mike does an incredible job of covering all of this. Uh, so on that, I'm going to go ahead and uh, pass this to Mike Moscato. Mike's all yours. Good afternoon. Uh, as Fred already mentioned, what we're going to cover today is uh, setting up the color settings in ES, uh, basically to get, well, hopefully, consistent and predictable color when you're soft proofing. I think we've found over the years that this can often be one of the most confusing aspects of uh, managing files in ES. Uh, and I think in general, just thinking about putting this together and going through it myself, you know, the color management has seemed to be this kind of dark art and there are so many pieces to it. And I mean, if you just see the lists here, right? Source profile, destination profile, simulation profiles, paper sins, rendering intents, ignore profiles, use profiles. And even if you understand those concepts, how those all interact with, uh, with each other in ES can sometimes be a daunting task. I mean, we've, over the years seen instances where a customer will rightly say, look at what I have on my monitor. I don't understand why it is this way. And as you can usually guess, it's because of the way they had it set up. But the settings themselves sometimes don't lend themselves to uh, easy interpretation. It would be nice to have just a one size fits all set it and forget it type of thing. But I think we all know that's probably not practical for the, the world we work in today. Uh, I'm not going to go through this whole bullet point list. If you kind of skim it real quick, this is the kind of stuff I'm going to go over today. And I am really going to, uh, I'm going to go obsessively deep in terms of clicking a lot of buttons and showing a lot of the different options in here. And, you know, we're going to spend a lot of time looking at the color spaces set up and the viewing conditions. And it's very possible I might not get past those. Uh, and uh, just try to review what it does, how it does it, and uh, why it does it, and why that might matter to you. Uh, and uh, lastly, I'll just say that in preparing for this, uh, I think I've uh, kind of run myself in circles as well. It can be uh, sometimes, uh, like I said, you can uh, end up confusing yourself to, to the point where you just start all over again. So we're going to start with the basics. Ooh, I have to take a photo. Let's get rid of that. Um, let me make sure I got my mail program closed. We're good to go. We're going to start at the most basic, and that is setting up within ES, a basic color space, right? And we know that if we're creating a project and we're uploading either PDFs or images to a project, we're going to initially define a specific predefined color space. I have a color space here and I called it ignore. I have my reasons for calling it that. Let's look at how this stuff is set up. These tabs here are very, very important and they mean very specific things. We're going to go through these real quick. Uh, initially, in any color space setup, you're going to tell what color engine you're going to use. I'm going to use the little CMS color engine. If you wanted to use the Adobe color engine, you could do so. One thing to remember is the Adobe color engine uh, with the Darling products will not uh, allow you to use the black point compensation uh, feature. 
That is just something that uh, Adobe has not uh, basically given Dolly the secret handshake to use. The next tab is probably the most important tab in this whole thing we're going to go through. This is the color rendering setup that's going to be used for your PDF files. As such, it has to be able to deal with uh, files that may have objects of varying, that come in varying color spaces. As you can guess, RGB, CMYK, grayscale. And just as in the Twist product that some of you may, may be familiar with, we have the ability to control uh, how color is managed on raster objects, essentially just images or bitmap line works, or vector objects. Although, um, in general, uh, I'm not sure it would very often be the case where you would want to run a different profile on the vector inputs versus the raster. And in this most basic of setups you see here, I'm telling it to ignore any embedded profiles in any object it sees. In addition, if the incoming PDF already has a defined output intent, I'm also telling it to ignore that. So we're basically saying, I want everything, I want my working space to be US coded swap. I don't care what the incoming PDF was uh, set to. Notice also any RGB objects are using a source profile, <coughs> excuse me, uh, the Adobe 98. Before we kind of look at a few files and see how the stuff all inter interacts with it, I'll just mention the other three tabs that, uh, again, sometimes can be a bit confusing because you look at this and you say, I got all my RGB set up here. What does this mean? The RGB? CMYK and grayscale tab are what are called or used if you're just looking at a single image. So you got a JPEG or a TIFF or a PSD file that uh, obviously exists in a single color space. And once again, you'll notice in this color space, I'm telling it for all of those instances, I don't care if there's an embedded profile, I'm ignoring it. Adobe 98, coded swap, and this is a grayscale profile I found somewhere. So any image formats, that's what they're going to be forced to use. So knowing that we've set things up in that way, I don't want to exit that. What does that look like if we actually look at files that use that? Now, I've got a bucket full of goodies in here. And for the sake of this test, I'm just going to open them all up. And I already see I'm going to have to start talking a lot faster. Uh, we don't want to spend uh, 10 minutes just on the most basic, basic. Let's just look at this guy, though. This is CMYK image. What does it use? It uses US swap coded. Why did it do it? Because we told it that's the output format for CMYK images. Here is, um, where was that other guy? Yeah, here's one I want to show. This is a PDF, right? PDF was also set to use US web coded. Now, here's something you'll sometimes see in ES that may look a bit confusing. This is that same file, this guy, except you're going to notice something a little bit different if you look at the uh, color settings over here on the right-hand side, although I don't see anything different there yet. Let's try that. Let me make up the wrong file. Do that again. Let's just open it on its own. Let's see what we get. Well, that's not good. Hmm. I guess you can never expect these things to work the way you want them to. Uh, what you will typically see when you open a file with swap, I mean with spot color in it, is your profile name will not be reflected with that same name. You'll, if you ever see something in the profile that says based on, that means that you're usually uh, viewing a file with a uh, spot color in it, and the profile itself is not built to handle a spot color. Maybe that profile is. OK, let's not get too bogged down in the minutia here. Uh, here's one thing I want to point out. 
if you look at this image right here, you notice, I mean, this, this PDF, you see there's two images in it. Those images are RGB images. So as you recall, in our color setting, we have a the Adobe 98 source profile. There's our output profile. So we'll see that this will render to screen for us the plaque plate that we will expect to see when this is converted from RGB to CMYK. So I don't think there's anything strange about that. What I'll point out though, and we have actually had someone report this before, that they were looking at some files and they knew they had RGB images in them that should be converted to CMYK. But when they viewed it in here, they saw no black plate. And notice we don't have a black plate. So now you ask yourself, if I have this US web coded output, it's a CMY color space, well, I don't have a, a, a black plate anymore. In fact, if I throw the densitometer on here now, we see there's no black as well. Typically in something like this, Dolly displays RGBs as just CMY, CMY. And the answer for them, and you should know the answer, you saw me do it. If you don't have a source profile defined here for RGB, it's not going to do any sort of color transformation from RGB to CMYK. So he should always be turned on for PDF. One thing I need to point out, and uh, I should say it probably 20 times, ES does not change the high-res file. No matter what you see in these color settings, the actual high-res PDF or images are never changed by the color settings here. The only thing that's happening is we're running through this color transformation to present these through the high-res viewing app. Now, here's another thing that can be dangerous sometimes. Notice that I don't have any source profiles defined for CMYK. And I'm going to go back to that same simplistic file I just had up. I should have kept it open. Here's what I want to point out. The way this file was put together, that grayish background in here is 10, 10, 10. And we can see the densitometer tells me that. It's just a three color gray. I'm not sure anybody would necessarily put a file together that way, but for these purposes, I'm going to do that. I'm going to go and make a change to this color space. Notice what I did is I defined a source profile for any CMYK vector objects. Now, what we know now then is that the color engine is going to do a color transformation from that source space to that web coded swap. And that profile I'm using is a very generic one that Darlene has supplied over the years. Now, if we look at this visually, uh, I don't think anybody's going to see anything look much different. But if I put my densitometer on there, now notice that's not a 10-10-10 background anymore. And furthermore, if I look at my solid black overprint text, that is not solid black overprint text. And we have, we've had instances of this before where uh, people have thought that, you know, ES was changing the color on the file and something had happened to their black text. All that's happening is that based on that color space setting, we actually told uh, ES to make a color transformation. Based, it, it, it's basically saying the source objects are defined with this like I said, it's a really generic color space, and it, we told it to transform it to that. Again, the high-res PDF is absolutely no different, but we've changed what we want to be pushed to the monitor when we soft-proof. As such, it's generally not a good idea to be defining a source profile in here unless you are fully aware that your uh, densitometer readings 
will reflect what happened based on that color transformation and not necessarily what's in the file. If I want my densitometer uh, values, especially in a CMYK PDF, to show me what's actually in the file, I should keep that source profile blank. Or, or sometimes you'll see people do this. They'll have the source profile defined the same as the output profile, which really does nothing because you're saying, uh, I'm starting at X and I'm going to X, so you really will see no change. Wow, I spent a whole lot of time on that. We're already halfway done. Okay, let's go real quick. Here is uh, something else. That is, this is a different color space. It's pretty much identical to the other one, except uh, Grackle is my output profile, and I have the option Use Output Intent. Here's another job that has that guy in it. I'm going to have to talk real fast. Let's just look at a couple of these. Let's look at, uh, we'll just use that same goofy file we've been playing with. I'm going to do that one again, see if it'll work for me. Now, I had the option use embedded. So you'll notice I didn't get Grackle used here. I got US web coded because that's the embedded profile in that file we have up there. If we click on our spot job, this is what I was talking about earlier. This is what I want. You'll notice with a spot color, it tells us that the profile is based on that. Quickly, you'll notice this little button here that says use enhanced profile. For this CMYK file, you notice it doesn't do anything. I can't touch it. That option is enabled only when you have a job that has spot colors in it. Now, if I click that, I'm frankly, I'm not sure you're going to see the difference in it. That orange color is a spot in here. Now, I, I know I saw it on my screen. I'm not sure if you did. But that option is to do more accurate rendering of spot colors in, in your files. So if you, by default, I don't think there's a setting that will always turn him on. So if you know you got a spot color job and you want to get a better idea of what the actual spot colors look like, you turn that guy on. The other point I really wanted to make here, though, is that uh, in this instance, the uh, defined working space in the color space is not being used because it, first, ES will look to see if there is an embedded profile, it will use it. And the other thing to, to mention is that the basic logic is if there is not a defined output intent here, use him. As opposed to the first one we did, I don't care if there is one, always use him. Okay, that's probably more than we wanted to know about uh, color spaces. Let's go to something that is, I think, one of the more misunderstood things with ES, and that is viewing conditions. At its most basic, you can use viewing conditions. Maybe you always wanted to uh, do a paper simulation. Notice I don't have to turn anything else on in here. You know, I don't have to use this closed loop color thing. I don't have to use a simulation profile. If all I want to do is just always have paper white defined by default. I can set that up in the profile. And I have one here. Let's make sure I got the right profile. That's the guy. So here's what I want to point out when we do this. Viewing condition can be assigned per job. It can also be assigned per file if you choose. Now notice something. Again, we're looking at our color settings down here in the lower right. You'll notice paper simulation is enabled. It's using the viewing condition that I told it to use, and I'm guessing this one did not have, yeah, it's got the, a grapple profile. But notice I cannot change anything in here. Maybe I wanted to turn him off, or I wanted to uh, turn him off and use black point compensation stuff. I can't do any of that. If a viewing condition is defined for the file, when you open it, you cannot make changes to any of those settings. Conversely, if you open a file like this one, in which no viewing condition is defined, 
you can just turn these things on and off with impunity and you could say you know what uh, maybe I want to use that double A viewing condition that we saw earlier notice when I choose him it automatically turned paper sim on because we knew he was defined in that way now let's get to probably the most confusing part of viewing conditions and that is the use of the option simulation profile now let's take a step back we know that uh, any job always will and must have a base color space defined so again let's choose this one uh, that guy that we're using so we know already that we have a specific working space defined so that being the case if my working space again for let's do this say RGB images Adobe 98 how does this thing come into play if someone uses what they call a simulation profile a simulation profile is another profile that can be stacked on top of the color space to simulate a different printing condition or a different output condition other than what's defined in your color space I think it is fairly rare that you need to do something like this but I'm going to show you a very uh, kind of over-the-top use for it that'll maybe make it more sense have it make more sense I'm not sure that's a CMYK image we have there and there's no viewing condition that's going to be assigned to it and my for based on the color space here this should use uh, swap coded now let's say using we wanted to try to simulate a slightly different uh, printing condition now I'm going to choose like we'll just say web uncoded now I'll, I'll guarantee that if you saw that change it was very subtle and you might say I'm not really sure what's happening here I'll make the mo a very obvious one I'm going to tell it to use a gray grayscale profile so what are we actually doing here and what here's what the you have to remember a simulation profile is, for lack of a better, better term is you're double dipping because what happens is initially uh, ES will apply the output profile and if there was no simulation profile what typically happens then is that then uh, applies the monitor profile which hopefully is calibrated and we get our display on the screen what we've done here is we have basically stuck this guy in between that transformation uh, from just output to monitor profile so now after the initial conversion to US web swap coded we then stuck this guy in to simulate what this would look like if it was uh, going to some uh, you know predetermined grayscale color space that's why you have to be very careful about using these guys because you are essentially uh, stacking on top of your initial document profile right and it's usually used to simulate like a proofer or something like that for most people yes now one thing I have seen certain customers do before and again I think maybe it's because they may weren't really sure what they were doing is uh, they would have the color space set to again we'll just use an example US web coded swap and they go to the viewing condition and they set a simulation profile of US web coded swap well that's really it's not going to do anything evil or bad because it's not going to do anything because again you're mapping a color to itself right or you're doing a transformation from X to X so you're not going to see any change and I think many current users what they really know viewing conditions for is they use it to set up the closed loop setting here and again all closed loop is for lack of a better term is it's a way to nag you into recalibrating your monitor uh, closed loop let, let, let's turn it on for that viewing condition basically every two weeks it's going to force me to check uh, my color calibration so in fact this is the image we opened earlier right if we try to open it and look at it again because the viewing condition on it has changed 
it's going to tell me you can't do anything because it it needs me to and this is a key thing to remember it's not telling me right now i have to recalibrate it's going to run a check routine to see if i'm still in calibration the check uh, color process is quite a bit faster than the full calibration so you know at this point if i wanted to continue working i'd have to whip out my uh, spectrophotometer and run through the quick uh, check routine to see if i'm in tolerance Wow, this is going fast. There is one other thing that I really wanted to go over. And this is something that's, especially for people who are still on ES3, I think this is an important thing to know. If you look at this job, the basic job here is set up with this grapple color space that I, did, I think I ran through it earlier. So I'm gonna open a file. And all I want to show you is the fact that this is using the Grackle profile. Fine and dandy, everybody's happy, not a problem. I'm going into a folder. This is that same file. I just made a copy of it. It's in the same project. Let's open them up. Now, typically, at least in old school ES, there was one project, one color space, that was it, unless you wanted to go file by file. Notice this file is using a completely different profile, and it even has a viewing condition applied to it, which the other one didn't. So the question is, how do you get files in the same project to have completely different color spaces? Now, one of the nice things you can do in ES4 is when you define folders, you could have multiple folders and you can assign different properties to those folders. Specifically in this case, tell it to use a completely different color space. If there is a different viewing condition perhaps you want to use, you can do that. And, and the reason I mention this is we've seen instances where, uh, at least in ES3, because you really didn't have this kind of flexibility, you might see sometimes someone might make a completely different project to handle the covers only because they do have a radically different uh, viewing condition or color spaces used for covers versus their normal body pages. And this can be set up directly within the project when you create it. You, you know, I, I, I manually created this folder in here and then changed it. Or if it's something that's, you know, very repeatable for you when you create project templates, and I think this is the one I was messing with. Yeah. You can already define within the project template that I'm going to make certain folders, right? And when those folders are created, I want you to assign different color space and different viewing conditions to it as opposed to what's contained in the main project. So if you look at this, Anything that goes into covers gets that covers color space. Other files in the main project, and I should have stayed where I was, will get this different color space. So within one project, you can have multiple uh, color spaces and color handling uh, based on how you structure things in folders. Uh, let's see probably already confused everybody beyond all reason. Uh, I'm just looking at my notes off to the side here. Did viewing con oh, here, here, here's, here's one other thing that's a real quickie. You may have noticed when we were messing around with this earlier, I had the uh, grayscale images. I had a specific profile assigned to it. Now, the fact is that is not a profile uh, that's supplied with ES. And I think I'm pretty sure ES does not come with any sort of grayscale profile. So if you have your own custom profiles you've built, and I tend to think if you're serious about this sort of thing you do, you have to go to the profile management option under color spaces, hit the plus button, browse to wherever you have your ICC profiles stashed, and just up upload them 
from here using the uploader. They'll appear on the list here, and you'll, you'll notice also that it does uh, detect what kind of profile it is. That's that grayscale one I uploaded, CMYK, RGB profiles, and so forth. So for especially if you have you know, different profiles you've generated based on your viewing booth and the viewing conditions you guys work with, you do want to upload them here and then uh, assign them to the appropriate color spaces that you're working with uh, in ES. Uh, I think I could get more into the minutia of playing around with things like paper simulations and black point compensation and all that stuff, but I'm not sure that's necessarily a wise thing to do. Uh, there is one other item I wanted to show you. Let me see if I could find it. Yeah, here we go. Now, you, you heard me mention earlier over and over again the fact that ES never changes the file. The color settings never change the file. So, of course, I'll now show you the one instance where it does change the file. Notice these two files here. It's the same file uploaded twice. But, and again, I'm not sure if you can see this, but you'll notice the white background is different on these two. Although, again, it is the exact same file. We, we actually had a customer complaining once because they had people downloading their thumbnails from the project, and the thumbnails kind of looked like that one. They had kind of a dirty white background, and he couldn't understand why. In fact, let's, let's just do this. We're going to go download thumbnail. And that should show up over here. Here's what I want you to see. Although the actual high-res file is still what it should be. Oh, come on. You don't want to unzip for me? I guess not. Okay. Well, here's my point. My point is that the background white of a thumbnail actually will change uh, based on a setting that's divorced from your normal color settings. So if you ever see this and you want to always make sure you get clean white backgrounds in your files, you can mess around in your color settings till the cows come home and it's not going to do you any good. What you need to do is go to your process parameters, whichever one you're using, and this rendering intent is what is used to generate your thumbnail images. If you use absolute color metric, that's going to put a paper simulation in. You're going to get that dirty background like what you just saw. If you want to get the clean white background so, you know, people don't freak out and think your files are getting changed, you should choose that setting and you get the nice clean background. And if you're really getting into the minutia, you can define which profile is used when it's uh, doing that transformation to create your thumbnails and preview files. Which, if I'm looking right, you have to type in instead of. Yeah, this is this is the one area where there's not a pull down for your profile names. You got to know it because actually I did this earlier and it failed because I forgot to put .icc on it. So you definitely have to know the full name of it to to enter. Uh, I don't know if I've uh, caused uh, more confusion or hopefully cleared a few things up. Uh, maybe we'll have to do another one of these. Yeah, we'll we'll see based on questions we get or you know follow up emails if it's uh, maybe we need to do a part two to clarify some stuff. So if y'all could send us some questions on that, uh, feel free. Mike, I think uh, you want to cover inks real quick to get completely through the color settings thing. We got a couple of minutes, and if this is quick, this should be quick. Well, inks are usually used for uh, if, if you're doing any sort of imposition stuff, I believe, and you have to do color mapping. Yeah, the, exactly. ES, right? in, the, in ES4, you, you have the ability to define the color settings for a job. And it's not just for imposition because this could be used just for the, the channel mapper or, or whatever they call that tool to check the color space of the files uh, against really, the, the, the job ticket. <laughs> Yeah, and actually, I should have had one of these ready, but I don't. This 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 is the way to 
get a bunch of pot, uh, pot spot colors <laughs> predefined uh, to upload uh, yep. a spot color list. And yep, uh, twist Darlene, and stall, Yeah, Darlene has, let me, you talk, Fred, while I look for it. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, so basically if you have specific spot colors you want to create yourself, you can add those in here manually. Uh, what Mike's doing is look and see if you can find a uh, .ptn file or a Pantone file uh, so he can import all of the list of spot colors into ES to add into that. Uh, so he found one. So basically if you have it, you can drag and drop it in here or browse to it. Uh, and, and it'll bring those in as a color space or color spaces into uh, ES itself. So he has a .ptn file, whichever one. Obviously, if you have Twist or Litho installed on the machine, all of those will be in there. And you should be able to go ahead and click on where it says Process Yep. And then yes. it'll have your list of Pantone colors on there that you can choose for your jobs. I'm not sure if the ink group is mandatory. Uh, yeah, it's basically telling it where to put it so that you can choose yeah. it when you go to a job. So you can have several different ink groups if you want. Yeah, but in terms of building a list here, I'm not sure it's something you can just add into this default list that shows up inside of projects typically, I think. Yeah, you can, but it's uh, I wouldn't. It yeah. kind of gets confusing just because I have accidentally. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I think that's probably a good place to stop. Maybe yep, there's some questions and, uh, on, on all the confusion I've caused. All right, uh, let's go ahead and uh, just some of the questions. Uh, uh, someone's asking uh, if all of this, uh, because you've been showing everything in the Java viewer, does this also ah. work the same way in HTML5? Well, let's do that. Let's see. Let's take the one of these viewing conditions, this one, <laughs> and we're, we're, we're going to do that ridiculous thing I did earlier. So we're going to make sure it's something that we can't miss. This thing, this viewing condition should change it to grayscale. So even someone as blind as me should see that. Oh, let's get into HTML5. It should do it. That, that's grayscale and it's got that really ugly paper white too. So it definitely did the job. The the, the 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 reason I've done everything here in the Java viewer is that for the purposes of kind of explaining a lot of these things, currently the HTML5 viewer does not have that color settings window. So there was no way for me to kind of point out, you know, this is being used and that's enabled or so forth. The main thing that is currently seen in the HTML5 viewer is you will see the monitor profile being used and you could change it if you choose to. But Dalim is actually, uh, I'm not sure if there's a time frame for it, but they're trying to build the whole closed loop logic into the HTML5 viewer as well so that those who want to can move away from the Java viewer and use this one, which I think anyone who's used it knows is much faster than the, uh, the Java one. Yeah. All right, the next question we have uh, is that enhanced uh, uh, version button that you showed for Pantone colors, uh, basically using the lab color lookup instead of a CMYK color lookup? I honestly don't know the answer because uh, I asked one of the Darlene guys about it about a month ago, and so far the only answer I got out of them is it's, it's to give you enhanced color. So that's, that's sometimes the kind of uh, uh, circular uh, yeah. answer you get from them, right? So I, I, honestly, I honestly don't know the answer to that. Uh -huh. Th there was a yeah, big and I don't either. That, yeah, there was a project at Dolling for a couple of years to get spot color handling added in here. And I have to think that that button or that option is the result of that. But yeah. in terms of how it's doing it, that's never been explained to us. All right, and then uh, the last question we have right now is, uh, 
uh, somebody saying they, they thought that we'd be covering twist settings as well and are asking if we've done a webinar before on twist or if we would do one on twist. And uh, we did have it in mind to add twist to this one. Uh, that's why it was on the original uh, agenda. But uh, as Mike went through, going through what he was going to cover, we saw that time was going to get eaten up really quickly because he's showing the differences in color. So it kind of got bumped from this one. But I think uh, it if you is give me uh, just a, like, cover. if you give me like a minute and a half, I'll give you the 25 cent uh, explanation and twist. But you're right; it's something we could always uh, at a further date. Yep. And while you're getting that ready, the next question that just came in: uh, Someone's asking, is there any chance that Darlene will get what they need from Adobe to allow Black Point compensation in the Adobe Ace engine? Boy. And, I, I, I am I not sure. To that. Yeah. yeah. What ba basically Adobe has two versions of their engine. Uh, one is the one they use. Their other OEM product does not have black point compensation. We don't know whether they would ever put that in there or not, or whether they're trying to make uh, their own just uh, better. Uh, so we're really not sure. It's kind of on the Adobe side itself. What I'm going to show you real quickly in Twist here. This is the ICC tool, and based on, you know, the stuff we were looking at over here, right, in our mixed uh, color settings, you can see that the logic is very similar. User ignore input profiles, right, rendering intent, different color spaces, source profile, output profile. And just as in... Mm -hmm. So obviously, in the instance of in the instance of twist, we are changing the file. Yes, <laughs> yeah, for sure. And just as we had the raster input and the vector input options here, right? You see, there's the different tabs, raster, vector. One thing twist has the ability to protect certain colors if you see fit, and obviously a whole bunch of other mumbo jumbo down here that uh, is kind of unique to twist versus the color setup we do in ES. But yeah, make no mistake about it. You run it through here, it's changing the file. Whereas yeah, and you'll, and you'll see that in the ICC conversion tool itself in twist, as well as the ICC tab in PS check uh, when you're running PDF files through it. Very well, one, one thing I'll, I'll mention that in terms of the overall logic, perhaps, of how you're processing files, if files are initially submitted to ES and they may have RGB CMYK elements in it, it would make, and, and then they would, you know, if they're approved, they're subsequently, subsequently going to get processed through twist. It would behoove you to make sure that your color settings in here mimic what your workflow is going to do, right? Because otherwise, you may look at it in ES based on certain, who knows, random color profiles you use, then run them through Twist, which may be using some other profiles, and you may say, gee, I thought I had that monitor calibrated. These things don't look anything like what I was looking at. So you would hopefully have your some consistency between the uh, color setup in ES and the ICC settings and any subsequent workflows that may process those files. Yeah, and I know you don't see it, Mike, but that kind of actually walked into another question that just came in, which is asking us to talk about how the rendering intent of the original file affects the use of the ICC conversion tool, which I'm guessing they're talking about maybe the rendering intent or what we're using in ES itself and how that goes over to the ICC conversion tool. So as Mike said, it is something you'd want to keep consistent so that your soft proofing environment mimics what you're going to actually change on the file. Yeah, within this setting, and I think it's also the same in ES. Yeah, you always have this option, uh, render intent, if there's one, whatever is defined in the profile, or you can force your own rendering intent on it. I think the default that Dalim uses in all the ES stuff is to be defined in profile one, but that certainly doesn't mean that's what you have to use. Right. And apparently we definitely piqued people's interest because we were getting more questions or more comments 
Uh, someone based on what we're just saying said, uh, you know, EI should honor the twist color settings. And I think, again, trying to keep confusion out of it, you know, what Mike's talking about in that scenario would be someone's doing soft proofing of RGB files, for instance, in ES before they're ever converted in twist. Uh, yes. As, as opposed to files that process through twist, do a color conversion, and wind up in ES for soft proofing. You would then in ES use color settings that aren't converting color space because you're at your final color space. Exactly. Because if if you if you do use settings in ES that maybe you know this is what the, what the example I showed earlier maybe you're changing you're forcing it to do some sort of transformation here that's the case where you may look, get what you thought was 100% black right but since you've run it through a conversion here you're suddenly going to go what the heck happened to that black text it's four color black so yeah it, that that's why I mentioned before that unless you definitely know beyond a shadow of a doubt, there's a conversion you want to do in here, I would keep the CMYK source profiles blank in here for this stuff. Yes. And then, uh, and then to cover the, the clarification on the previous question, it wasn't rendering intent they meant, it was the output intent. And in Twist, you can use the output intent as oh, yeah. that final to, to use that to do your conversion. That's exactly what it's there for. Yeah, and, and if, you're, if you're embedding an output intent in Twist, if you're pushing them into ES, you want this guy turned on. Use output intent of incoming file. And again, the logic of this is if there is one, use it. If there isn't, use him instead. So he's right. kind of and your same fallback. Thing in twist. And same thing in yeah. twist. If there's an output intent you want to honor from the file to do your color conversion, you can do that. Yep. In fact, if you see the way they phrase it, output, <laughs> use, use it if it exists. Otherwise, use him. So, yeah, Twist will – the other thing you got to be careful uh, about is Twist, uh, there's two steps to it. This basically tells it to keep it, but if you're then subsequently going through an output PDF tool – we're getting into Twist now, probably shouldn't have done that <laughs> – there's this option to write output intent. And if you have that turned on, you're going to kick out any existing. So you got to make sure he's not turned on. Otherwise, you're going to screw up what you dealt with earlier in the uh, ICC handling. So make sure he's not turned on. Otherwise, you're going to kick him out. All right. I think on that, uh, since we're already uh, at 10 to uh, 2, let's go ahead and uh, wrap this up. Um, so thank you everybody for attending the webinar. Uh, I hope you found it informative and as always you're always welcome to send us emails, follow up if you think of questions or especially if you think of uh, additional things you'd like us to cover in future webinars, uh, just send an email to us at text, T-E-C-H-S at blancis.com. We'll be happy to consider those, put them into our future webinars and uh, cover that material, or if it's just simple questions that you want answered uh, that you think of after, send them to us there as well. We'd be happy to answer them. Again, we'll be doing these on the second Wednesday uh, whenever we can of every month. Uh, every now and then they do get rescheduled if they conflict with something, like we would probably not do one uh, if it conflicted with something like Duo or something like that and reschedule to maybe a following week. Uh, but if you go to the uh, our events page at BlanchardSystems.com, there's a full calendar of when we plan on doing those webinars and uh, allows you to pre-register for them uh, in the future. So again, thanks everybody. We appreciate you attending these and hope you find them informative. Everybody have a great day. Bye.